Hi, uh, my name is Shannon McCloskey. I am the in-hospital organ donation coordinator out of Island Health. Um, I am pleased to introduce to you to Trish Bosch. She's the in-hospital organ donation coordinator for Interior Health. Um, and my counterpart, she has 30 plus years of, <laughs> she's not too happy with me about that, um, <laughs> of nursing experience in a varied roles. And she's been with BC Transplant for about four, four and a half years in various roles. And she's gonna talk to you a little bit about what we do. Thanks, Shannon. Uh, let me start by saying that I am grateful to the planning committee for inviting us to share our role at BC Transplant, and I'm humbled to be able to stand up here and speak uh, amongst the crowd of speakers today. And I can't see them all the other. <laughs> uh, just to declare I have no relevant uh, conflict of interest in giving this speech. Um, our learning objectives today were to really um, increase awareness about our role at BC Transplant, the role of the in-hospital coordinator is a small component of that. Um, and, and for me personally, um, my talk will have heavy emphasis on the organ donor uh, registry um, and people um, honoring that and taking the time to discuss with their families um, their wishes. <clears throat> and then to just clarify some myths um, and realities about um, transplant and donation, because I believe that they uh, exist even within the um, healthcare professional group. Two types of donation that we cover within BC, and I'll go through some of these quite quickly because I think the important stuff is near the end of my um, presentation. We have, of course, living donation, which you heard about from Dr. Landsberg, and um, our role um, is involved with the living um, donor role, but primarily on the deceased donation end. Um, and it just lists the organs that we work with in donation and transplantation in BC. Uh, we are an agency of the PHSA, of course. Um, we have three transplant centers and eight um, post-transplant clinics throughout the province. Our donor numbers, um, Dr. Landsberg touched on it and Ed touched on it, and I think they're quite remarkable. Um, and part of what we hope to demonstrate in this talk was that the uh, implementation of the in-hospital coordinator role has played a significant um, part in increasing those numbers. I, I would um, never claim that it was the sole reason um, because the in-hospital coordinator role is a very small part of our organ donation hospital development team. There are only four of us uh, that formally work within the role uh, throughout the province, one in the Fraser, one in the interior, uh, one at Vancouver Coastal, um, who also shares a role with the Northern Health, um, and we have um, a coordinator who works informally in the in-hospital role with BC Children's, and then of course Shannon on the island. So our numbers, I wanted to highlight um, the hospitals that we are embedded in. Uh, so in the Fraser, um, Jan Emerton is the in-hospital coordinator who works with the Fraser Health and she's embedded at Royal Columbian Hospital. And I think that um, the numbers are reflective of the work that's been done there. I'm embedded in the interior with an office in Kelowna but work with all of the hospitals within the interior. Shannon, um, Embedded at VicGen might be a big word because she works equally between uh, the Royal Jubilee and Victoria General. And Sandy Baisley is our um, Vancouver Coastal and Hospital Coordinator who also um, works with the North. And so I wanted to highlight the numbers and the increase in the numbers since the role was implemented thanks to Carl Roy and his suggestion and then the implementation in 2011 when the first in-hospital coordinator was put in place at Vancouver Coastal. Um, our stats, um, other people have highlighted on those, but um, it just suffice it to say that um, donation, deceased donation within the province um, is higher than it's ever been, which has resulted in transplants for more patients with the group that you work with. The registry, uh, Peggy John and her staff uh, work diligently uh, doing community awareness projects throughout the province and you've heard about the Service VC implementation so we have more and more people registering a decision on the registry uh, and for this group, um, you know, I would never ask uh, for a show of hands for who's registered but I would like you to just stop and think about for a moment if you yourself would consider a transplant in a life-saving um, event um, and if the answer for yourself is yes then ask yourself the next question have I 
gone through the motions and discussed with my family and actually made a decision. Um, registering your decision, whether it's yes or no, on the organ donor registry is one of the most powerful things we have the ability to do as a human being. Um, working with families who uh, are burdened with that decision at the end of life, um, I can tell you from personal experience that it's one of the most difficult things families struggle with is separating their own decision about end of life decisions versus their loved one who can no longer speak for themselves. And families are conflicted when they have to make that decision for you. So even if it's a strong no, just register the decision because you'll release your family of the burden in the event that you die in such a way that we can pose that question. Our role, um, as I said, was implemented in 2011. It didn't have a lot of structure around it. Um, everybody just knew it was a necessary role. So we um, do things, we work in collaboration with our physician leads in the hospital, in the, in the um, regions. We report to Ed, who is our provincial operations director in term. Uh, we guide the hospitals in a collaborative way in policy development and procedure writing. We support and implement an organ donation committee in each of the hospitals and health authorities that we work with. We're the on-site resource for all aspects of donation, really, and those, those have a really wide range um, of duties um, and committees uh, that are ongoing. We provide the bedside support to the critical care when there is a donor identified in their eMERGE or critical care. Uh, we support the families, which is a huge role um, that has been missing within the province when people were based in Vancouver. Um, a lot of what other people have talked about really resonated with me in that we had always tried to deliver donation care from Vancouver uh, when in fact we have a really large geographical province and we need to take that closer to home. Uh, we interact with community stakeholders, including, um, like the gentleman who spoke before me, including the First Nations co uh, community. When we're in the community and embedded and people have coffee with us and they learn to understand a bit about our job and they trust us more, um, then some of those misconceptions around donation start to go away and you can be more culturally sensitive and socially sensitive and non-judgmental about the people and their families that you're meeting in the ICUs. We also um, participate in a 365-day, 24-7 call rotation with our colleagues. Uh, we take referral calls from the hospitals every day of the year. Um, we go on site, meet families um, uh, after the ICU has um, determined that um, this family member is at end of life. Um, we approach them for what their decision would be, of, uh, whether they would entertain the possibility of organ donation, and then coordinate the logistics um, and allocation of the organs, and then support the family through that process, which can be a 24 to 40, really, hour process. Uh, we have surgical recovery specialists who work as a part of our team, um, and after all that front end stuff is done, then a surgical coordinator comes and goes to the operating room and stays with the patient in the operating room and honors them through the gifting, really, of their organs and manages the transport of the organs back to the transplant centers. I just thought this quote was meaningful, so I wanted to throw it in there. Some of the misconceptions um, that I think that healthcare workers can have, as well as the general public, have highlighted here. I think that a lot of people still believe the organ donor registry is tied to your driver's license. Um, I think a lot of people, even healthcare professionals, believe that if they arrive in an emergency with a grave injury, that people will look at that and not treat them the same. We maintain the organ donor registry. The hospitals only call after they meet trigger criteria, uh, so no one can tell whether you're registered or not within the hospital. They have to call BC Transplant to learn that. Um, you know, you hear in the public, when you're doing public community events, people will come up and say, nobody would want my organs, I haven't been very good to them. Um, and that's really a myth too. We, we, we encourage even hospital staff to not be judgmental about the person that's in the bed, that allow us to um, at least go down the road a little ways to see if they have uh, an organ that's transplantable. And there really is no limit to the age. BC Transplant removed the age from the uh, trigger criteria in 2014. Um, so there is no age limit to donate your organs. 
And most religions um, actually support and encourage donation. When you talk to people outside of the end of life phase, um, most people support it. Um, it's just a very scary conversation to have when you're trying to face uh, the loss of a loved one at the same time. Transplant recipients can still donate their organs. And a lot of people believe that if they consent to organ donation, that that will dictate the, the type of funeral and honor that they have at end of life. Um, and uh, the bodies look the same, uh, whether they've donated their organs or not. Less than 1% of people will die in a way that allows them to donate their organs, which makes these people very special. Um, when we work with families uh, through the process of making the decision to donate their organs, I think um, families take away some peace and some comfort and some hope that their loved one died in a way that made them really unusual and made them very special and that they could um, give a gift that the majority of us will never be able to give. Oh, sorry, that slide's mixed up. Uh, no, we don't, re we don't, we're not responsible for the cover of funeral or, or cremation. Um, and uh, it's a question a lot of families ask. Um, and so we have to be very clear and transparent about our process um, and ethically never appear to be uh, paying for organs. Um, lots of people think they registered a long time ago, uh, that it's on their driver's license, and, and I just put that in there because it's very simple on our BC Transplant website with your MSP number to log on and see if you did, in fact, register 15 years ago. Um, back to, you know, just, just register your decision. I tell people that I work with and staff that I work with, e you know, even if your husband, because uh, it's always nurses who say, you know, my husband's really against this, um, then tell him to go on and register no. But ask him why he's really against it, because it's usually fear, um, and it's usually all those stories that we make up in our head about what happens to us after we die, and that it's a really gruesome procedure. Um, I can tell you that those patients that are lucky enough to be able to gift their organs at death, uh, go to the operating room and treated with um, more respect than the average living person that goes to the operating room for a surgery. Get involved, we always invite people to get involved. Um, Peggy and Megan are here, I haven't seen anyone else, but we have a very large um, community support and volunteer uh, component to BC Transplant, um, and they're always um, open to people who want to become involved and and um, help us recruit um, at community events. This is a letter. Uh, Shannon very graciously um, lent me this letter. It was sent to her by a family that she had worked with on the island. I'll give you just a, a minute to read it because it's quite powerful. So those are the kinds of families that we get to work with. Um, and I, as Shannon said, um, I've been a nurse for 30 years, which is kind of hard to believe. Um, but I feel strongly that for some reason I was directed to this work and that it's my life's meaning. And on that note, um, I have a very dear colleague that I've known for many years who's also an operating room, who's also a BC transplant employee, who's also very special in that she is part of a donor family, um, and she's going to come and just share a few words about a donor family perspective, because I think that there's only a few of us in the world who are ever privileged enough to work with these families, um, and the more information we as healthcare professionals can have about this process and what it means and what you can take away from this conference um, might be life-changing. So on that note, I would like to introduce my colleague, Vicki Dabbs, and she'll share her story. Sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> so, hello, my name is Vicki. I'm a registered nurse and I work with the surgical recovery team at BC Transplant on the donation side. 
A few years ago, our family was notified that my brother Patty had been admitted in critical condition to the ICU in Victoria. Our family gathered and over the next eight to 24 hours, we watched and waited. His injuries were extreme and his condition unstable. The whole situation looked dire. After extensive testing, there came a time when the doctors felt that there was nothing more to be done to save his life. And had Patty ever discussed organ donation? I'm forever grateful that my two brothers had had a frank conversation about their end of life issues. It turned out that Patty was a registered organ donor. For me now, there's a great sense of peace in knowing that we were able to honor his wishes and make a huge difference in some other people's lives. It was shocking to have my work world collide with my personal life, something I never anticipated. This experience has made me even more passionate about the donation process. In death, Patty was able to give the gifts of life, and that provides some comfort to me in my missing him. Thank you very much. Somebody's got to have one. No? I thank you for your time uh, and enjoy your conference. Uh, it's been an honor and a privilege to speak with you today. Oh. Just sorry. Just Don't ask a hard one, Jag. No, it's not a question, more a comment than anything. So I just want to thank uh, you guys for putting this together because I think it really demystifies a process that a lot of us don't want to think about, quite frankly. And so I think I thank you for doing that. Um, you know, as, as I was listening to this conversation, I was thinking about altruistic people that I know. And I think we come across a lot of these people in our day-to-day -day line of work. So people who come forward for living kidney donation, their families, their friends, families and friends of people who we take care of with kidney disease every day. And I wonder if there's opportunities for us to really consider bringing up the notion of deceased organ donation in those populations. I'm not sure if BCT's ever looked at that formally, but might be something for us to consider in the renal community as well, because I think we have an opportunity to have those conversations or at least have that, that information out there for people who we know are very directly affected by kidney disease, some sort of end organ failure. So just a comment, I think, for all of us to consider as well when we're doing our day-to-day -day practice. I would agree. I think that you have uh, an opportunity to contact you know, a huge number of people every day in your practices. And even though you're working in a dialysis clinic, working with you know, one member of a family who is unfortunate enough to have kidney disease, there's a whole family and there's a whole network. And I think that it's, it's uh, an important role that healthcare um, practitioners play in just um, bringing up the conversation. You're not, it's an, they're not, you know, they're, there's not an end of life situation and it's at end of life that this conversation is very difficult. It's actually a really easy conversation to have uh, when none of us are thinking about end of life. Um, and when you talk to people in social settings or your family when no one's sick, um, everyone agrees with it. It's when you add the uh, emotional stress of end of life that it becomes a difficult conversation. Thanks.